Hello everyone. My name is Karen Laird and I'm the editor of Sustainable Plastics. Welcome to Ask the Expert, our new live stream series. Ask the Expert is your chance to engage with professionals, to address the current business environment, to discuss best practices, and to ask some questions. The topic of this series is bioplastics and bio-based additives. And today's experts, we have two of them, are Ludwig Schmidtchen, who is an application engineer for biopolymers at Brabender GmbH, and Matthias Meiser, who's a system architect at New Technologies. They will talk about natural seaweed polymer processing and how this can contribute to addressing the urgent plastic waste. In Europe, packaging constitutes about 60% of all plastic waste. And while product lifetime is generally just a few weeks, plastic packaging is built to last years, decades, or even centuries. A better availability of cheap and easy to process alternative materials could offer a solution. Ludwig and Matthias will be happy to answer your questions after their presentation. To submit a question, email spevents at crane.com. Or if you're watching along on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, please submit your questions through those platforms. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Matthias, who will take the first part of the presentation. Take it away, Matthias. Thank you very much for the introduction, Karen. Hello, everyone, to this webinar about the processing of natural seaweed polymer. My name is Matthias Meiser, and I will be giving you a very short introduction to the topic and how we came to actually work on this and what we are doing. I'm an uh, applications engineer and development engineer at Brabender with biological and engineering background and mostly develop new measurement devices. We're both employed at Brabender GmbH and that company specializes in lab scale extruder equipment as well as quality measurement equipment. So how did we end up investigating natural seaweed polymer? Well, the starting point is something that Karen already mentioned and that we all know about. The amount of plastic waste that is accumulating worldwide is increasing exponentially. All the while, the rate of recycling is lagging behind. For example, if we look at the situation in Germany, where we are situated, we see that around 5.2 million tons of plastic waste are generated each year. And through the whole process of recycling in different directions, only 15% of the whole plastic waste gets recycled. More than two thirds are incinerated during the process. That part usually ends up as CO2 and contributes to global climate change. But even more worryingly is this part. In worldwide numbers, around 32% of the whole plastic waste leak into the environment, mostly due to mismanaged plastic waste. If we look at a map where this mostly happens, we see that the percentage of mismanaged waste is highest in African and Southeast Asian countries. So establishing effective waste collecting systems in these countries in the near future is not very likely. And so to tackle this problem, we have to do something different. There are two approaches to that. Either we prohibit the packaging at all. You see here that uh, the number of single-use packaging um, bans is increasing quite drastically in the recent years, also kind of like a exponential growth. And um, this even increases. Currently, it's on hold a bit during due, uh, due to Corona, but it's expected to increase again afterwards. However, packaging is very important to prevent waste spoilage 
And so this is only part of the solution. Another solution is to use bioplastics. Those come either as bio-based or biodegradable or ideally both. Problem here, however, is that biodegradability, for example, isn't very well defined. If we look at PLA, a very well-known bioplastic that's biodegradable, and look at the degradation in certain environments at different temperatures, we see that at 25 degrees Celsius, PLA basically doesn't degrade at all in a matter of one year. Only at higher temperatures, it degrades under circum circumstances, like in compost or in wet environment. On the other hand, if we look at thermoplastic starch, it already degrades at 25 degrees Celsius in a matter of days. This is, I think, in soil. Um, so as you can see, bioplastic is not equal to bioplastic, and you have to choose the right material for the right application. Another problem with bioplastics is the price. Usually, bioplastics are somewhere between three to five times more expensive than conventional plastics. And this is where our biopolymer comes into play. Seaweed is a rather cheap material, as Ludwig will tell you later. And he came to us with the idea of processing it with an extruder, and we had all the quality measurement equipment and extrusion equipment to test it. And that's how things started. And Ludwig will tell you more what we developed so far. Thank you very much for the introduction, Matthias and Karen. I'm going uh, to talk today about the potential of seaweed and how we can process it as natural polymer material. So seaweed is an incredible under-recognized resource. If you are looking on the net primary production, we see that seaweed has among the highest net primary production compared to other uh, ecosystems. For example, the tropical rainforest is more or less uh, the same regarding the net primary production. But if you are looking on the open ocean, it has a far a lower net primary production. Looking on the share of global on the global surface, we can see that the open ocean has about 65% a share. Why it's only 65%? Because we are talking about the open ocean. If we are adding the coastal waters, we will end up at 71% of the global surface, which is covered by water. The tropical rainforest is covering about 3.3% of the Earth's surface, and seaweed beds are only covering 0.1%. You might ask, why is the part of seaweed beds so small if we have so much uh, sea area or ocean area? It's quite simple. Seaweed requires a certain substrate to grow on, so it's not growing everywhere. And seaweed requires uh, sunlight. If the ocean is too deep, there's no sunlight reaching the ground, so no seaweed can grow. At the end, we end up with this 0.1% of the global area, which is uh, covered with seaweed. If we are adding a uh, combining the net primary production and the global uh, surface areas, we end up with a share on the global net primary production. Here we can see, despite the small net primary production, that the open ocean has among the largest contribution to global net primary production. The tropical rainforest is more or less the same because the net primary production is so high and we see that seaweed is a bit lacking behind. But this is also the potential of seaweed. If we manage to use this very high net primary production and increase it to a larger area where we are growing seaweed, we can yeah, change a lot of things and create a raw material for many applications. Looking on how to scale it, we have about 20% arable land, 9% barren land, and 71% of our globe covered with the ocean. The World Bank made a study what is required to cultivate 500 million tons of seaweed dry weight per year. This would require about 0.03% of the ocean surface. To give you an impression, this is about the area of Thailand. 
if you are cultivating this amount of seaweed, we would remove 18% of the nitrogen, 61% of the phosphorus, and 6% of the carbon, which is brought into the ocean by fertilizer and greenhouse gas emission. So the cultivation of the seaweed would have a positive impact on the ecosystem as well. We would not only have a positive impact on the ecosystem, we would also have a positive impact on the uh, society because seaweed is mostly grown and cultivated in poor coastal areas. So we would create employment and this would contribute to SDG number one and SDG number eight. Furthermore, we would uh, establish a new industry in those areas contributing to SDG 9 and the seaweed based uh, biodegradable material would be perfect for a circular economy contributing to SDG 12. The before mentioned positive impacts on the ecosystem would contribute to SDG 13 and 14. To establish such a uh, seaweed industry is not possible without uh, international collaboration. So we would also contribute to SDG 17. So far, we have a very, very good collaboration with the University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute. They are working on the development of a new seaweed species for cultivation and on cultivation systems. We are also working with Coast for Sea, a nonprofit organization which is uh, empowering fisher families in the Philippines to start a sustainable seaweed business. A short summary, seaweed is a very good renewable raw material with among the highest net primary production. We have no competition for arable land and we have a positive impact on the marine ecosystem. The carbon sequestration is reducing the ocean acidification and the removal of nitrogen and phosphorus is reducing the eutrophication of the ocean. Furthermore, the seaweed cultivation beds are creating a nursery for many marine organisms. The employment is created in poor coastal communities and by creating the employment, we are reducing the damage to the ecosystem by overfishing and illegal fishing activities. Now we're coming to the main part, our seaweed polymer material. And for this, we require the hydrocolloids. We have three main seaweed categories according to the pigmentation of the seaweeds. We have the green seaweeds, red seaweeds, and brown seaweeds. They are all containing special hydrocolloids. The green seaweeds are mainly containing cellulose and starch. Red seaweeds are mainly containing agar and carrageenan, and brown seaweeds are mainly containing alginate. For industrial interest, it's mainly the red seaweeds and brown seaweeds. Green seaweeds containing starch and cellulose are not so interesting. Today, for agar extraction, it's mainly gelidium and gracilaria used. The carrageenan is extracted mainly from capophycus and alginate is sourced from Ascophyllum and Laminaria. Here you can see the monomers of those hydrocolloids, but we don't, do not need to discuss the chemical structure in detail today. They are used in today's uh, stabilizing agent and thickening products, mainly in food and feed industries, but also in pharma, paper making and printing applications. How are those hydrocolloids produced? There's no, not a single process to do this. So it's always depending on the seaweed and the hydrocolloid. I'm just showing you a very simplified process to give you an impression what's uh, needed to do so. We are always starting with the fresh seaweed, which is getting an alkaline treatment. This alkaline treatment is necessary to break off the hydrocolloids from the cells so they are available and can be separated from the rest of the biomass. This is done by filtration and we obtain a solid and a liquid phase. In this example, our hydrocolloid is contained in the liquid phase. So in the next step, we need a precipitation to dry or to again filter our hydrocolloid from the liquid phase then we can dry it 
and obtain our purified hydrocolloid. As mentioned, the hydrocolloid for other seaweeds might be contained in the solid phase, so there are both possibilities. If we have our seaweed more or less extracted, we want to produce, in this case, a film. And this is done mainly by solution casting today. The oldest publication regarding solution casting of seaweed is from 1913-4. It's a patent from Japan. And in this patent, it's described, this innovation relates to the production of artificial film from seaweed and the like and contemplate the conversion of the seaweed into film, such as that known under the registered trademark cellophane, having advantageous properties. So the patent is describing a process to extract alginate from brown seaweed and to produce a film out of this material. What's a solution casting process? For solution casting, we first have our seaweed, which can be fresh or dried. This need the pre-treatment or extraction, which I described two slides before. This is necessary to break off the hydrocolloids from the cells. In the next step, we have the solution or we are preparing our casting solution, which contains mainly water. So the water solid ratio is 71 up to 20 to 1. Uh, Apart from the water, we are also adding some additives to adjust the material properties. Then this casting solution is poured onto a flat surface and the material has a thickness of several millimeters because during the drying process, we have to remove all the water or nearly all the water again. And this means the material is shrinking. The shrinkage is a large problem. And at the end, we have to remove our dried film from the surface and we obtain our thin film. Looking on the water solid ratio, the solution casting process is operating somewhere there. So we have a very high water content compared to small solid content. And the solution might be, if we are moving more to the left, to operate at the lower water content. And with our extrusion process, we are operating somewhere here in the middle of the graph. So the water content is far lower compared to the solution casting process. Here it's a comparison. And the solution casting process requires quite expensive material because we have this pretreatment and extraction steps. The extrusion process is just using the seaweed as it's grown and dried. So there are no further extraction purification steps required. Then extrusion requires a far lower water solid ratio. And all the water we are adding to the process at the beginning has to be re removed by drying afterwards. This means high energy input, a long time for drying, and a huge volume shrinkage. So we can see the volume shrinkage for solution casting materials is very, very high. For extrusion processing, it's still high, but it's far lower compared to the solution casting. And if you are looking on the process time, you can see that the extrusion process, starting with putting your dried seaweed into the extruder until you obtain your final dried product, is only a few minutes for the entire process. The solution casting process from starting the pretreatment and extraction of your hydrocolloids until you obtain your final dried film will take hours or days. So in conclusion, I expect that it will not be possible to produce uh, products based on the solution casting process on an economic viable scale. If it's possible with extrusion, we don't know yet, but at least the extrusion process has the potential to deliver economic viable products. The process we are using is starting with the seaweed. You can see on the right side, it's being dried in the sun. Then we are milling it to a smaller particle size so we can feed it into our extruder. The extruder we are using is a twin lab C. It's a twin screw extruder 
with 20 millimeter screws and 40D screw length. After the material went through the extruder, you can either produce a film, for example, or other shape products, or you produ produce granules. Those granules can be processed in the next step also as film or as something else, however you, whatever you want to produce. To do so, we are using our Brabender equipment, which is proven in thermoplastic processing for decades. And it offers a very high flexibility for new applications like this and for other R&D applications. The operation scale is about one to 20 kilogram we are able to process for seaweeds with this extruder. In the picture on the middle, you see a post-treatment step to dry the material. And on the right side, you see the final dried, no, on the left side, you see the final dried material. One very important advantage of the Brabant equipment is the horizontal folding liner. This means after stopping your process, you can open the extruder liner and see what's happening to your material and the screw elements. So in my opinion, this is very important and necessary if you want to analyze what's happening with your material in your extruder. And it's the basis to optimize your screw design, to optimize your process, and to optimize your material at the end. Because if you don't see what's happening with your material in the extruder along the screw, it's very difficult to, you know, to adjust the process if you simply see the product coming out of the extruder. And beside this, it's also very easy to clean if you can open your extruder. The product we are obtaining is water-based, so we do not need any chemicals for production, and it's easily biodegradable. It's also highly oil and fat resistant, and it's translucent, which means it's a kind of semi-transparent, as you can see in the picture. The mechanical properties without additives, it has a good tensile strength, but the elongation at rake is quite low because the material is getting brittle over time. It's also heat sealable, depending on the moisture content. You might ask why we have only a few properties mentioned here. It's simply because and this is part of my PhD research. And by time, we are testing more and more properties. And the list will be longer and longer. Apart from film extrusion, we also tested the extrusion of pipes or other shape products. And we also test the discontinuous extrusion process like the injection molding. And yeah, those processes are also feasibly tested. So it's possible, but it's not focus of our current work. Again, a short summary on the extrusion process. So the extrusion process offers a lot of economic advantages compared to the solution casting. It's based on a reliable and proven equipment from the thermoplastic processing industries. And this is a requirement if you are thinking of upscaling and industrial scale production. Furthermore, a very important advantage is the low energy and resource consumption. If you are looking on the entire process from harvesting the seaweed to your final product. This is also in comparison to other bioplastic materials because we are using the natural occurring polymer. So compared to PLA, we do not need to synthesize a new polymer. We are simply using the polymer as it's occurring in the natural seaweed. So more or less the nature is doing the work for us. Yeah, and all in all, the process has the potential to be competitive with petro-based thermoplastic processing. And our material is easily biodegradable, which is very important. Now we are going to have a look on the lab extrusion and how it's running the process. Okay, now welcome at the application lab. Here we have our process already running, but first we will have a look on the raw materials we are using. We are using different types of red seaweeds. 
For example, this is a cuma, also called spinosum, or uh, capophycus. Here, another type of capophycus. For the process, we are grinding our seaweed. Here you can see different particle sizes, for example. The seaweeds are all, all containing carotinan at the moment and are sourced from uh, cultivation sites in the Philippines. Now, let's have a look on the process. Here we have the main part of the process, our twin screw extruder, the twin lab C. This is driven by the Metabridge software solution, which enables us the process control. Then we have our feeder and a pump adding water to the process. In the front of the extruder, we have our die head mounted. This is a 150 millimeter uh, slot die, which is adjustable in the die gap. And to show you how the material is looking, we have our conveyor belt installed in front. The benefit of this extruder for use in research and development application is the flexibility. We have four different uh, feeding ports on the top and two side feeding ports below this cover. Today we are using the first one for feeding the seaweed, the second one for feeding the water and here we could either add other additives or install a temperature sensors or a pressure sensor for example. Now let's have a deeper look on the process itself. The feeder we are using is a gravimetric feeder. It's adding the seaweed in the process. Then the screw is conveying the material forward to the uh, water feeder, the pump. Here the seaweed is absorbing the water uh, which is added. Afterwards it has time to be heated and it's under pressure and shear. In this uh, process part here, the seaweed cells are being disrupted and uh, the carrageenan is released from the cell walls. Then we have the carrageenan mixed into all the other parts of the seaweed and it's uh, available as new polymer to create the new bonds. In the die head, the seaweed coming out of the extruder is shaped in form of the film in this case. And what's happening here in the die, the seaweed is brought into the, the shape and when leaving the die, the gelation of the carrageenan is taking place. So right here on the front, when the seaweed is still very hot, the material is still very flexible. So if we push here, we are making dents or ripping off the film. When the material has cooled down over the conveyor belt, it's getting stronger and already uh, quite strong and flexible. So we can still destroy it and rip it down if we are yeah, ripping it off, but it has already a, a certain a strength and flexibility. But this is not the final product. When leaving the extruder, we will need some water to enable the, uh, yeah, the more or less extraction process of the carrageenan. And this water has to be removed to uh, obtain a storage stable product. How this is done, we are not showing this time. There will be maybe an, a further webinar where we can show it to you. But I have to show you the final product here. This is how a dried film is looking. You just can see that it's not perfect in the shape if you have a closer look, yeah, if you have a closer look, 
you can see that the material is not completely flat. This is due to the shrinkage of the material. Then you see smaller defects in the material and the line. And this is caused by impurities in the raw material because we have a natural material which is not 100% pure seaweed. We have plastic, stones, shells, all different stuff inside. And how to handle the drying issue, how to remove or take care of the impurities, this will be part of a further webinar where we will show you how to do it. I hope you enjoyed the presentation of the process in the lab. We are now just having a short look on the prospectives. So our key activities are on the development of suitable additives to customize the product properties according to different applications. And we also want to demonstrate concrete product applications. This means if you have a certain application where you think, okay, the seaweed based film might be suitable for packaging, then feel free to contact us and we can discuss if and how uh, the film could be used for your application and if we could demonstrate it. We are focused on the film extrusion as mentioned earlier. So it's mainly for flexible packaging in the non-food feed or food markets. Other applications or products like injection molding are also possible in case of special interest. Then we're already at the end of the presentation and I would like to thank you for your attention. Well, and thank you Ludwig and Matthias for a very eye-opening presentation. Um, and we're now ready to take questions. Uh, let me remind you to submit a question, email spevents at crane.com or if you're watching along on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, submit your questions through those platforms. So, and we have one question from a viewer on LinkedIn who is asking about the ISO tensile sam sample size. Is, there, yeah. is that something you can tell us about? Yeah. The sample size we used for testing the tensile strength and the elongation is according to ISO. I don't have the number of the ISO standard uh, in mind, but it's the same size as it's used for paper and plastic uh, films as well. So the distance between the clamping size is, I think, 100 millimeter and the sample is 15 millimeter wide. Okay, great. Um, very clear. Um, tell me, uh, what size film can you produce? Currently at the lab, uh, the largest die head we have is this 150 millimeter die. So the film is a bit smaller than 150 millimeters because they have a certain sh shrinkage as mentioned earlier in the presentation. Right, okay. And um, is it possible to process the seaweed on um, a normal extruder, one that's that's used for thermo thermoplastic processing? Or um, can, can, you, can we also use one like that for seaweed extrusion? It's not easy to answer because there are many different types of extruders and this is a new application. So for a, such a flexible lab extruder as the Brabender Twin Lab, it's possible. But if you have an industrial extruder for one application for producing a certain product, I think it won't be possible because yeah, there are some things which has to be modified, I think, in order to process the seaweed correctly. Okay. And here's someone who has a question about the controversy about carrageenan, uh, the risk of cancer. Um, what role will it play in using seaweed as a biopolymer on a wider scale? 
Well, I guess um, they're hinting that there are some studies that uh, connect carrageninan. For example, it's used in cream um, to possibly produce, uh, increase the risk of cancer. Um, the study wasn't very clear about that. So it's a potential risk and mostly when heated. We do hit it in our process, but our film is not intended to be eaten. So it's basically packaging. And there, um, the cancer risk from just the packaging material is rather low. OK. And I have a question about, um, did you try to produce alternate films instead of carrageen? So we were running first trials, but we didn't test it as extended as you're doing with a carrageen on film. So only first uh, initial tests. OK. Is that something you'll be doing in the future? Um, maybe it's not planned in the near future, because the carrageen on is, or the seaweeds here in carrageen on are much more interesting in terms of uh, price. So alginate based seaweeds are not available in such large quantities and at a low price like the carrageen and bearing seaweeds right okay <clears throat> uh, another viewer wants to know um, what is the cost equivalence of seaweed film versus a conventional film for example a meter roll of pla yeah this is a very difficult question which can't be answered at the moment we can have a look on the raw material price so as mentioned in the presentation the seaweed costs are somewhere below one euro to or one us dollar below one us dollar to one us dollar per kilogram of seaweed and then we have to add the process costs and how much the process will cost on an industrial scale we can't say at the moment Right. Of course, we are still at the lab scale and it's yeah, not possible. OK, that's clear. And um, let me see. Can you make the film hydrophobic? We don't know. Okay. So we are working on or developing additives and working on this. But um, I don't know if it will be completely hydrophobic. And I don't know if it would be positive because the film should be biodegradable. And it's very important for the biodegradation that water can somehow interact because water is mainly yeah, the carrier for bacteria and whatever to enter the material. OK. So it might be possible to add kind of like a hydrophobic layer on one side of the film that's in contact with the packaged good and have the other side non-coated. That way we still have the biodegradability, but would still have the water repelling function on the other side where it is desirable. Right. But it's not developed at our current stage, um, but might be possible. OK, and um, here's somebody who would be interested uh, to know more about, is it water resistance or water vapor permeability of the film? Can you say something about that? Yeah, it's more or less the same with the hydrophobicity of the film. So at the current stage, the film is water soluble. If you are putting it into water, it will dissolve in quite a short time. We didn't test it, the water vapor permeability because um, we do not expect it to be quite high. Okay. To achieve this, the water resistance and uh, water vapor uh, permeability, I think it will be necessary to add a certain coating to the material. OK. Um, here's another question from LinkedIn. If the packaging is biodegradable, um, can we define the shelf life of film? Of well, film? As I showed earlier with PLA, the degradation is very dependent on the um, 
conditions under which it is supposed to degrade. So yeah. under dry conditions, some films can last very long times and then in soil compost or in water environment, they will degrade rather fast. So if we want to tune our material to certain conditions, it's possible. But as Ludwig said earlier, um, in water-based environments, our film is not very durable at its current stage. So it will be mostly dry applications where the film can be used. Okay. Um, and how big is the carbon footprint of alginate extraction? Uh, does it negate the carbon sequestered by the seaweed biomass? I don't have any data on this, but I think I I read a paper on the sequestration of carbon by the seaweed cultivation, and there's also some yeah a certain footprint for harvesting the seaweed, for drying the seaweed, for making it storage stable, and this study was uh, investing it, investigating it for seaweed cultivation in Europe, which means we have to dry it using electric energy or other thermal energy, so we can't use the sun energy. And in fact, this was already cons or the footprint for making the seaweed storage stable was more or less the same as this carbon sequestration for the seaweed cultivation. So I would expect that the extraction process has a larger footprint than the seaweed uh, sequestration. Okay. So it's important to mention that for our process, we don't extract the alginate. Yeah, or carrageenan. Yeah, no. okay. Um, here's another question about the biodegradability. Uh, I think it's more or less the same one. It's, uh, the viewer would like to know what would the effective life of the packaging be? Yeah, it's Depends. depending on where the packaging is being used. Mm -hmm. So right. if it's used in a dry condition, it will last quite long. We have film samples which are quite old, uh, more than one year. And um, yeah, it's depending on the condition of storage and how it's used. Yeah. And is the material certified, is compostable or biodegradable according to any standard? So far, it's not uh, certified to, according to any standard because we do not see the need at the moment. We are not targeting uh, any products or current products which are close to the market. We are still in research and development and the product is made 100% from seaweed so far. So there's no reason why it shouldn't be degradable, more or less like seaweed. Okay. But it will be definitely tested if there's a certain uh, way or intention to produce products based on the seaweed-based film. Right. I had one question. I was just curious, um, is there any uh, problem with odor when you're using seaweed? Maybe, but not with the seaweed we are using currently. So there are other seaweeds which have a certain odor, but yeah, the extrusion process and the temperature is also removing this to a certain point. Okay. And also to mention that in the dried stage, um, the smell is much less than what you usually pick up at the beach when you are close to the sea and have the seaweeds there and smell this characteristic smell. Mm -hmm. When you've the material processed and dried, the smell is much, much less. Yeah, the, same the, the seaweed lying on the beach, it's mostly old seaweed which already started to, to, to degrade and it's not fresh seaweed. So the order of fresh seaweed is far less than of old seaweed. Yeah, just like fish. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. 
All right. Well, um, I don't see any other questions coming in right now, so uh, we can wrap up the Q&A. Um, let, um, let me repeat that viewers can send any additional questions that did not get asked to either of the emails that are now being shown on the screen. And we will answer them later, or they will be answered later. Right. And um, before we go, uh, just two more things. First, I'd like to say thanks to our speakers, the sponsor company, and all of our viewers today. And I hope you enjoyed the session. Second, I'd like to ask you all to hang on for a final word from Brabender. Thank you. Hello, everybody. The production of measurement devices and lab scale extruders is a core competency of Brabender. But aren't it the applications that bring life to that equipment? Here at Brabender headquarters in Germany, we host two application labs, one for the plastics and rubber, and one for the food and feed applications. Furthermore, we run an application lab at our US-based facility in New Jersey. Within the labs, we test customer materials, develop methods, and provide trainings. Furthermore, we support our R&D in terms of the development of new devices and features for our customers. We would like to evaluate which measurement system is the optimum for your specific raw material or application. You have got an innovative idea and would like to run test batches on an extruder? Verbender is your reliable partner for your R&D and product development. Today we would like to take you on a tour through our laboratories and show you our facilities and equipment. Welcome at our application and laboratory for plastics and rubber. I will guide you to our laboratory. My name is Martin Schwarz and I am responsible for this lab since 2001. On more than 500 square meter or 5400 square feet, we have most of our modular product portfolio available for the support of our customers. With customer samples, we are effecting feasibility tests, validating prototypes and software features, and offering trainings on purchase equipment. We are in cooperation with universities, research institutes, and companies in terms of research projects. Let's start with the exuders. In this part of the lab, you can see several types of single screw exuders we are offering. Our twin screw exuders provide ranges of 12, 20 and 25 mm. On request, we can downscale production lines, including volumetric or gravimetric dowsing systems, specific dies and the required downstream equipment. The exuders are designed as standalone device or as modular system, which consists of a torque remeter and the attachment. Another kind of instruments are internal mixers for the analysis of the flow behavior of polymers. In a separate room, we run our absorptometers to identify the oil absorption numbers of carbon black, silica or fillers and our void volume meters. Furthermore, we offer instruments like the ELA test to estimate the density of unvulcanized rubber. Do you have got any questions or challenges regarding applications or measuring principles? My colleagues and I would be happy to assist you.